morning. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Betty Sanders, and this is Water Smart Gardening. And as she said, I'm going to talk primarily about how to stretch water, how to, when you don't have water, when it's not available. I live in the town of Medfield, which has four rivers running through it, one of them the Charles, and the state allows us to take exactly zero water from any or all of the rivers. So we, de we, we depend on an aquifer. It's the same aquifer other people depend on. So every time it's a dry summer, we have water bans. And people go, oh, what am I going to do? Well, plan ahead is the big one. Zurich Garden is the proper name for, water, for growing with less water. But it's Greek, and people don't like it. So I stick with it for smart. Greek, Zurich means dry. It doesn't mean desert. That is a common mistake. People think, oh, if you're talking Zurich, you're talking growing in deserts. You're not. New England gets 40 inches of rain in an average year. I think this year we may be up to 50 or 60. But then again, we could have a dry summer and a dry fall. So we've got not dry land, but we have it when we don't have water when we need it. Zurich gardening is maximizing the water when we have it and minimizing plant damage when we don't have the water. That's the important part, making sure the plants don't suffer because the rains aren't there when we need them. This is my first Zurich garden. Uh, I have a nice big house on several acres of land backing up to a pond, but this area out in front was as dry and hot and sunny as land could get. It also was over 300 feet from the house, so there was no way I was running hoses out there, and I don't believe in water systems because I think that they're a crutch that a good gardener doesn't need. So what we did is we took out the grass that was there for starters, and we put in plants that can survive happily with a lot less water. There are lots of things that are native to the Mediterranean. There are lots of things that are native to New England up there. It's just that they are plants that would grow where they could get wet or stay wet. So the next most important thing is to think about employing good gardening techniques. Water lasts a lot longer if you make the right decisions when you're putting your garden together. First of all, think before you plant. If you're gonna plant this stuff, you don't need water. If you're going to plant these, Mother Nature tells you, you need water. You need water. So keep that in mind, that some things will grow happily without much water. Some things need a lot of water. Uh, is this the right plant in the right place? This is a hydrangea. The first word in hydrangea is water, hydro. Obviously, they like water water. What has somebody done? They put it in a desert. They surrounded it with paving, then they planted a little bit of soil it had with a whole bunch of other stuff. This thing must be watered constantly in order to have it in bloom. There is no way that plant should be growing there. It was a very bad choice by somebody. Make your gardens grow tolerant by planning before you plant. Think about it, prepare what you're doing. If you're up on a hill, the hill's always going to be drier than this down below. Keep that in mind. It doesn't mean you can't grow a tree up there. It means you've got to think about how you're going to get that tree established for the first five to ten years of its life so it grows deep roots and can survive up there. Um, prepare your soil. I teach soil science for the master gardeners and for national garden clubs because to me there is nothing more important in gardening than the soil. If you don't know what you have, how can you know what you can grow in it? So, Get a soil test. The state of Massachusetts, in my opinion, has one great bargain left, and that is a $17 soil test from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. You send in your little sample, they send you back so much information. It is absolutely astounding. Uh, my husband and I run a community garden in our town, and I do a soil test every year on it. It tells you the pH. PH is how acidic the soil is. This is New England. Soil is acidic. Because this is a vegetable garden, the soil gets a lot of lime put into it because vegetables, as a rule, do not like acidic soil. And so the pH is a little higher than normal, 6.3. Great for the vegetables, not good for native New England plants. Uh, but that's fine. That's what we need. It tells you how much phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium are in there. Those are very, very important nutrients. If you don't know what's in the soil, how do you know how your things are going to grow? 
you can see the phosphorus is too high here. That's because a lot of fertilizers have phosphorus in them. The potassium is perfect. The uh, calcium is way too high. That's because everybody's heard if you put calcium around your tomatoes, you don't get blossom end rot. The problem is you don't need to put a ton of it. So that's something we have to work on with people. Uh, the magnesium is very high, and that is because in New England, our calcium comes from ground up mountains out in the Berkshires, and those mountains have a lot of magnesium in them, so we get more magnesium than we need every time we get calcium. It's okay. Neither of those are toxic. Neither of those are going to hurt anything. And then you get into the micronutrients. They are not important in New England because our soil is made of ground up rocks, the mountains around us. They, are, they tend to be full of minerals. In some parts of the country, you have to constantly add minerals. Aluminum is only important if you've got too much, just like lead. If you have very little, as we have, it's not important at all. These over here are important for the other reasons. This is, can your soil behave the way it should? And I'm not going to go into a full explanation on that, but it does. And organic soil matter. If you don't have 5% organics in your soil, and organics are anything that used to be alive, the broken down leaves, the dead animals, the, the basically what's formed by all those living things breaking down, if you don't have at least 5%, you can't keep the other things you need in your soil alive. Your soil needs to be full of bacteria and fungi and nematodes and a zillion other things who carry on a thousand absolutely wonderful, uh, fabulous interactions that make our soil living and make plants able to survive. I'm going to take a little detour here. I was in Cambridge a couple of months ago for a lecture by Bill Kalina, who used to run Garden in the Woods, the New England Wildflower Society, and now runs the main botanical garden. And he was talking about the fact that they are now taking electron photographs of soil organisms interacting with roots. And the soil organisms, I mean, I'm talking about bacteria and fungi and nematodes, things you can't see, literally will bring a nutrient that a tree needs to its roots. And the tree will give it a tiny drop of sugar that the leaves have made. I, I am so blown away by the very idea of that, which is why we don't mess with our soil. We want our soil to be good. Okay. How do you make good soil? The easiest way is to add compost. Compost is simple to make. You can buy a nice bin at Home Depot or someplace. You can have somebody make a fancy three bin system. Or if you're not close to your neighbors and you don't have a problem with skunks and woodchucks, you could just have a pile like that. Um, whatever you do, making compost is easy. It's not smelly. It is. Uh, it's natural. If composting wasn't natural, we would still have dinosaur bones lying around here. Okay. I'm not going to go into that because that doesn't want to do. Kitchen scraps, vegetable peelings, bread, pasta, rice, eggshells, coffee grounds, anything except meat, fat, and bones can go in. And then your garden debris, clippings, leaves, weeds not in seed, dried flowers, pine needles, anything not diseased or with seeds. And I exclude from that one other thing, grass clippings, because almost everybody treats their lawn, and they treat the lawn with things that kill almost everything else. So if you have a treated lawn, never put your grass clippings in your compost, because it will kill all the bacteria and fungi who are doing the work of turning everything into this perfect soil. Prepare your soil by adding the organic matter, which increases its water holding capacity. If you think about soil as just soil, dirt, if you will, uh, the problem is it can't hold water very well. It is the organic parts of soil that hold the water much better. Water just runs through sand, and if you've got nothing but clay, it doesn't go through it at all, and then you're in even bigger trouble. Uh, the organic matter also adds nutrients in a usable form. Once again, organic matter is full of the microorganisms that live in the soil. They can't live on a grain of sand. They can't live on a dot of clay. They can only live on the organic matter. And they're the ones who are bringing the nutrients. And the best part is, 
they can't pollute because they never can be there in high enough qualities to pollute, unlike putting or, you know, inorganic chemicals that you bought at Home Depot or your favorite nursery on. They can pollute, these can't. It's vital to build that soil web that I was talking about, the microorganisms. If you don't have organic matter, you don't have microorganisms. The beach has no microorganisms living in it, and the water, and you can't grow anything there. After you prepare the soil, plant correctly. This is the biggest problem for the homeowner, usually. They don't plant correctly. When I was growing up, my parents, who both grew up on farms, would buy a tree and they would plant, they would dig what I call a teacup. Straight sides, flat bottom, put the tree in, fill it up with good soil. Not what came out of the hole, but good soil, and then expect it to grow. Now, they usually did. They, they, they were good enough. But what you actually want to do is do this. Because when the roots start out, they're going to go into the good soil. And when they hit that not so good soil, they're going to say, whoa, I'm going to go this way and stay in the good soil. And they end up wrapping themselves around. If you do this, by the time they get out there, the soil should be a kind of a mixture of both the good and the not so good. And they will go into it. It sounds so stupid, but it's not. When I learned how smart your average plant is, I was astounded. The other thing is to absolutely never plant, and it's hard to tell on anything other than trees and shrubs, but this, this area right here is the most tender area on any woody plant. This is where this goes from being a stem, meant to be above ground, protected by bark and such, to roots, which are meant to be below ground. If you have your soil line too low, you'll kill the roots. If you have it too high, you will subject this to being moist too much of the time, and when it's moist, that means things can bore into the uh, bark and into the tree or shrub or whatever and kill it. So make sure you look for that little flare and you put the, the soil line right there. You've also now made yourself an easy place to, to water because this soil is going to absorb water better, which will make life easier for the tree or shrub or whatever you put in. Uh, when you finish planting it, use a rim. Don't bring mulch right up to it. The mulch will make it wet and that's bad. So use a rim and then you can water into that rim. The water stays there. Now you're not having the water flow off. You're saving water. You're, you're conserving the water and getting it right where it needs to be. <clears throat> Usually you need to water you know, an annual or a perennial for a few weeks. A shrub, one or two years, depending on how big it is when you put it in. A tree, five years. And people say, wait a minute, five years it should have a big root. Yeah, but we tend to buy a tree that's this high in a pot that big. It has very few roots and it needs time to get them out. So this is where you're expansive with water. You're putting it on them whenever the soil is dry for up to five years. I just bought, built a new house a couple of years ago, and most of what I put in was small, but I wanted a couple of tall trees in front, you know? So I bought a couple of 15-foot tall trees. They will be watered for several more years. Every time we don't get rid I haven't watered them at all this year, amazingly. Uh, the one inch of caliper, when you buy a tree, it's often the price is based on how big around it is here, and so you'll know what the caliper is. And if you don't, ask the people at where you buy it. And if they don't know, you might want to look someplace else to buy your tree. Mulch, 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 but do it right. Mulch holds water. It holds it in the soil by reducing evaporation. The mulch itself isn't holding water. It's keeping the soil underneath it cooler and drier and, and, and protected from the sun and the wind and therefore reducing the evaporation of the water that you've put in the ground. If it doesn't evaporate, then it keeps going down in. It's available to the roots, to the water being planted. Um, this morning, my, before we left, my husband, in fact, you can tell because I got some dirt on my pants, uh, we were out watering some new perennials that we just put in because I wanted them watered while they were still in the shade. So the water has a chance to sink in before the sun comes along and evaporates it. And that's really important if you think about it. 
always try to water early in the day. Not late in the day because unless, if you're watering a tree, it doesn't matter. But most things, if we're watering perennials, we're watering for, If you get water on the leaves, they're more susceptible to disease at night when the sun's not baking at all. If you do it in the morning, they dry off naturally, everything's fine, and the plant's got that water during the hot part of the day when it needs it the most. Um, mulch keeps the roots in some cooler, I think I've already said that. It's protecting it from that, you know, the sun beating on it so much. Instead of wood mulch and bark chips, consider using just chopped leaves. Our woods should have told us that all centuries ago. The woodlands are full of the leaves that drop down naturally. Am I walking out here? I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> they're, they're full of the leaves that fall down. You don't go out there and sink up to your hips in the leaves. No, the leaves aren't that deep because they're constantly breaking down. They're constantly improving the soil underneath it. They're constantly providing nutrition for the trees and anything else growing in the forest. And they're where they should be. When we use wood and bark, it's primarily carbon. And as it breaks down, it removes nitrogen from the soil. In other words, one of the components that the plants need the most gets taken out just by the wood chips breaking down. That's not a good trade-off. But if we use chopped up leaves, when they break down, they need carbon. And the plants need the carbon. So it's a much better idea if you use chopped up leaves. Well, where do you get chopped up leaves? When I had a lawn, which I don't anymore, we mowed our lawn and never raked it in the fall. We'd mow it whenever there were leaves on it. And we would save those leaves, which got chopped up by the mower, in piles, and we would then put them underneath our trees, our shrubs, any place where we wanted to mulch. They look perfectly fine. In the winter, there are fabulous mulch for them because they hold some air in there, and they keep it a little warmer, they keep it nice, they allow water to flow through, but they keep the temperature moderated just so they should summer and winter. And at the end of winter, they're mostly gone because they've broken down just like nature intended. God did not have bark mulch fall from the sky to take care of the forests he put in here. He had leaves fall. And we should follow that, I think. Um, it makes a lot more sense for us. And when the leaf mulch is broken down, it's improved the soil. So you've taken care of multiple problems at once. You've taken care of mulching with less work. You've taken care of improving the soil. You've taken care of keeping your plants happy. The other thing is, should you put leaf mulch on like that, I guarantee you in a few days it will be gone. The wind will blow it away, all the rest. Whereas if you put bark mulch on like that, it stays and then it damages the tree. This. Fine. And if you put it under, I put it under all my shrubs, I put it under my trees, I put it over flower beds, I put it over everything, because it just sits there and breaks down. And people have done you have a lot of work in the spring? No. There's very little left in the spring. Usually what's left are the twigs and such that got mixed in with it. Not a problem. Water smart. Oh gosh, I think that's the name of this, isn't it? Okay. First of all, water only when you need to water. If it rained last night, go out and check. I have four rain gauges around my property. Because some areas, because of trees and such, get a lot different rainfall than other areas. So I go out and check my rain gauges. You don't need fancy rain gauges. For many years, all my rain gauges were the cat food cans. You know, that's all you need. They'll tell you if you got an inch of rain. They'll tell you if you got half an inch of rain. They'll tell you if you just got a little wetness. And that's it. Now, I also have rain gauges that are this tall now. I don't give them they're fancy. I like them. But I don't need that. All you need is a tuna can, a cat food can, any small can with straight sides. So anything falling down into it ends up down there. And you can come out and look and say, yeah, we got half an inch of water last night. I can't water anything today. Or you can come home like I. I a business I was in Kentucky and Mississippi earlier this year. And I got home and looked at one of my rain gauges and said, we've had eight inches of rain? You know, well, I certainly don't want to water anything this week. So know how much is falling before you put anything on, before you even think about it. You haven't been there, you might not realize when you come home and everything looks dry. 
But if the last few days you've gotten an inch or more of rain, you don't have a problem. Maybe containers. Maybe in your containers they dry out. But even with that, you got this great tool. If it doesn't feel dry, don't let it. That's my rule with containers. I stick my finger in, go down maybe two inches, yeah, I have to go back and scrub my nails, but that's okay. I know whether or not it's wet or it's dry and whether it needs anything help or not. Okay, use your fingers. God gave us great tools. I don't understand why we have to buy tools for everything. Not so smart watering. Misaimed and broken sprinklers drive me nuts. We have a house on a pond in a town that's perennially dry, and we have a next door neighbor with three acres of grass, and I'm not exaggerating, and a sprinkler system. Their sprinklers watered their lawn. They watered part of our yard. They watered the street. They watered the sidewalk. They watered their driveway. In a town with water bans at times, they're watering their driveway and the street. Make sure if you've got a sprinkler system, it's watering what needs to be watered, not the gutter. That doesn't need to be watered. So make sure you're not wasting water and wasting your money by this water going off where it doesn't flow. It's a lot cheaper in the long run to have somebody come out and fix it. <clears throat> this is the way we water. We use what are called tree gators on brand new trees. Um, they're very simple. It's just a tube. You stick your hose in there and you fill it, and the bottom is full of little perforations so that water seeps out over several hours straight down into the root zone. No wetness on the tree, just water going into the root zone. They have fabulous. Be careful. These people also make one that goes like this, comes up and down the side of the plant. The, it's like a cone around it. Once again, you get wet bark, wet bark softens, and insects and such can dig in there. This is the other thing. It's called a water wand. It's nothing but a pipe with perforations in the last foot. And you can stick it in the ground exactly around the plant. Um, when we first moved in, we put in about 30 shrubs. And we just moved that thing from shrub to shrub every half hour, do one set one day, do the next set the other day. All of the water going straight into the root zone. You're not wasting water. Even my town during the water bans never complained about using these methods because <coughs> they knew water wasn't being wasted, unlike the people before me watering the street. Don't kill your plants with kindness. And this goes back to you know, looking at rain gauges, whether your rain gauge is fancy or the tuna can, it will, does work. And when you do water, water deeply. Plants' roots are not that deep. The water should go down even for, this is a, um, you know, Honey so. pardon me? Honey so. No, Neil, that is not. It's a perennial. Okay. Come on, it's the native oh, of oh, Columbine. Thank you. I love my husband, but he draws it, no plants. Uh, the, even a Columbine's roots go down three inches. So don't give it a quarter inch of water and just water that top part because then we'll keep its roots up high where the soil dries out fastest on a hot day, give it enough water that the roots will stay deep where they should be. Don't use bad volcano mulching. This, as I said, will kill your plant with kindness because you will allow insects <coughs> and even some small animals will burrow in there and gnaw right into the bark of the tree and they'll be happy as I'll get out and <coughs> your tree won't be. If you do this, where you can see the flare of the tree, and you can see it even on small bushes, you can see that little bit of flare where it comes down. Uh, if it's not keep being kept wet, it's much happier. The problem is, if this gets wet, anything can gnaw through it. And if they gnaw through it, that's the end of the tree, or the shrub, or whatever, because it's now open to any bacteria and insect that comes along. Use native plants. I, am, I, I went from somebody with a garden absolutely full of Asian plants because most of our invasives in this country come from Asia. And I'd like to say, okay, I was 35 years younger than I am now, and that's my excuse, but it's not a good excuse. I should have known better. I now have a garden that is 98% native plants. And you know what? It's beautiful. And it blooms from 
as soon as the snow melts, right up until the snow flies. Because there are native plants that do all of those things. Shrubs and trees and perennials and all the rest. Native plants are adapted to our climate. They do well. They're naturally drought tolerant. Why? Because we don't think of it that way, but it's true. We have a wet, cool spring. We have a hot, dry summer. We have a wet, cool fall. And we have a cold, absolutely waterless winter. I don't care if we have 10 feet of snow out there, the plants can't get the water. So the plants that are native have adapted to that. They know they can't look for water in the middle of winter, which is why you often see people say, you know, water your plants well in the fall, because they've got to soak up all the water and save it to get through the winter. They also tell you, you know, in the spring, you probably don't need to water. Maybe something that's brand new needs to be watered, but everybody else knows how to get the water themselves. This means, of course, that we don't have a weird summer with no rain in the spring, uh, but generally we're fine. So think about that. You have to water in the summer. You don't need to water in the spring. You don't need to water in the fall, as a rule. And in the winter, you just pray. <laughs> uh, native plants are, are unpalatable to deer and other wildlife. They evolved with them. And so if you've got a plant that came from Asia, the deer will just eat it up. I love hostas. At my old house, with my old landscaping, I had 127 varieties of hosta. And I went out and sprayed them with stuff that stank and apparently tasted very bad to, to animals at least once a week, often more. And they looked beautiful, and I loved them, and they were great. At my new house, I have eight hostas, and they're in pots. Why are they in pots? Because I don't have to worry about the deer that way, because I can move them. I can keep them close to the house so that the deer won't come up to them and eat them. And because they're there only because they're very, very beautiful, and I really love hosta. But I've replaced them with other things that are equally beautiful and that I don't have to worry about, that I'm not spending all of my time either watering or spraying to protect from other animals and such. But unpalatable is a really big deal. My town has an enormous population of deer. For a while, we had the highest rate of Lyme in the, in the state. And we also have a huge population of turkeys. And I back up, part of my land is conservation land, and I back up to acres of conservation land. And you know what? I don't have deer in my yard. They come through and go, huh, damn, this is all made of plant material. I can't eat this stuff. And the turkeys come through, but only because we feed the birds. And they've learned that we throw things at them. So, you know, they're not a problem now either. The native plant movement became big, but 10 years ago or more, Westchester Community College planted their campus, which is enormous. I mean, you need a car to get from one building to the next. They planted most of their intersections with native plants. When they did so, a lot of people said, are you nuts? It's not going to look good. It looks beautiful. And I will tell you, as someone who's been there more than once, that those things tend to be covered with butterflies and birds all the time. Why? Because these are the natural foods for our birds and for our butterflies. So you get beautiful, beautiful plants. You have a very low maintenance level. And you get the birds and butterflies, which I think are the best decoration in any garden. Um, some of our native shrubs like it dry. Lilac, not native. Prosythia, not native. Witch hazel, nine bark, native. Smoke bush, native. Butterfly bush, not native. Low bush blueberries, native. They all will take very, very dry conditions. High bush blueberries also native, and they will take very dry conditions. <coughs> They'll also take wet. You got a soggy area, plant them, they'll be happy. You don't have to do weird things. Low bush are great. I've had them as a forest floor cover around the edges of the woods on my property. They take a lot of shade in addition to everything else. Uh, some native trees like it dry. Eastern red cedar. To me, they look so much like the cedars you see in Italy. How can you not love them? 
Uh, the northern red oaks, and in fact, most oaks are, are very, very drought tolerant once they get going. First few years, water them. After that, they're on their own. Black locusts, sugar maples. We don't realize that sugar maples are drought tolerant. Um, Oxygen tells this is a gorgeous tree that is just not used very much. And it's another tree that can live in very, very dry locations as long as it's watered for the first couple of years of its life while it's getting its roots out there, which kind of makes sense. Then there are lawns. This is where lawns evolved. Lawns evolved on the great estates, mostly in England, somewhat in France, and they were two things. One, they were a way to see if somebody was coming towards you. Remember, many of these houses were built when you still had to worry about somebody coming with a spear in their hand. Um, but the other thing was, they, they, they gave you a place to parade around. The first time I went to England, we went to the, um, come on, come on, the name of it. Describe. The estate where Winston Churchill grew up. Like Something like that. Okay, whatever. It has the great lawn around it. You know what else they had? Now this is back in the 70s. I don't know if they still got that there. But they did then. They had sheep. They did not mow. There were sheep and sheep dogs. And the sheep dogs literally moved the sheep from place to place. You might have to occasionally watch out for a little you know, gift from the sheep. But they were fertilizing while they were keeping the, sheep, the grass trimmed. Nobody went out and mowed it. The sheep did it. And the sheepdogs took care of them. I mean, is that a great system? But what do we do? We go out and mow it. This was my neighbor's house, my last, my neighbor's property, my last house. We lived there for 14 years. I never saw anyone except the lawn service on that lawn, with two exceptions. Once a year, my neighbor would come out and practice his putting. And Twice, when their children graduated from high school, there were groups of kids out there getting their pictures taken. That was it. In 14 years, that's all we ever saw in that line. Why did they have all that line? There was absolutely no reason for it, except that's what was there when they moved into the house and they just loved it. Traditional and organic lawns both require huge amounts of labor, fertilizers, water, Herbicides, pesticides, things that are bad for the world, bad for us, bad for the environment, bad for the animals, bad for just about everything except grass. Because the, in order to have perfect grass, you can't put down any herbicides or pesticides. And when you kill the pesticides, you in effect are killing the birds. Because birds, 90 plus percent of their diet, particularly when they're reproducing, <coughs> are insects. And if there are no insects, don't be surprised if you have no birds in your neighborhood. One third of all the water we put on the lawn is lost to evaporation, wind, or overwatering. One third of all that water that is being put down is just gone. We never see it again. When we mow, people mow too short. If you mow your grass to three or four inches, it shades the roots and therefore allows them to hold on to their water. On a 90 degree day, if you're shape mowing down to two inches, which an awful lot of people do, you are creating a 90 degree plus temperature down on the soil because the soil is just getting baked and all the water bakes out. If you leave the clippings on your, on your lawn instead of bagging them, they both feed it, but they also continue to shade the roots. They hold the moisture in. What moisture there is, they hold it in. We've got to completely rethink the way we mow lawns if we're going to have lawns. We've got to think about improving the soil instead of just adding chemicals to it. And we've got to think about conserving the water that's there rather than simply bringing in tons and tons. You don't always need a lawn. <coughs> I lived in New York City. I had a lawn. I had a front area. Some people had lawns. I had shrubs and ground covers. You know, ground covers are great. You don't have to mow them. You don't have to take care of them. You just got them there. It's really wonderful. 
Try shrubs, use ferns if it's shady. Other perennials as appropriate. They will take no fertilizers once they're established, no uh, pesticides, and a lot less water. I don't know about your town, mine the water bills are ridiculous. We just got informed that they're going up by 25% this year. Uh, this is my current home. And this was taken two years after we moved in. And what you see are all native plants with the exception of about 3,000 bulbs. I call bulbs, oh, and the one lilac tree which was on the property when we, we bought it, uh, friendly aliens. They're not native plants, but they're friendly. They don't cause problems. They don't bring in disease. They don't gulp huge amounts of water. And I couldn't live without spring bulbs. And all the joggers and the runners and bikers on my street go by going, like your daffodils. Thank you. Um, you don't have to have a lawn. Now, the neighbor on this side, when he saw us doing this, after we'd moved into the house after it was built, said, when's the lawn going in? Never. This is going to be a garden. He made some, I will not repeat, disparaging remarks. After three years, he actually came over and said, no, it doesn't look too bad. Well, I have to tell you, right now, this is almost completely filled in. We've only been there five years. And what it is, is it's all in bloom. It's in bloom from the beginning of spring right through the end of fall. Something is in bloom. The shrubs, every tree in here blooms, uh, all the perennials, and we never water. We watered when the trees first went in, and that was it. Everything else is on its own. This is my August border along the driveway. Never watered, completely on its own. You plant it, you water it that first couple of months when it's brand new, and then just leave it. It gets nothing. It doesn't get fed, it doesn't get watered. Those are all native plants that come back. This, by the way, turns completely purple in about a week after this photo was taken. So you can imagine the colors going up through there. What are those plants, could you tell us? Oh, that's from Becky up. Uh, this is um, da, 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 Bee Balm Monarda. Uh, this is um, Helianthus. It's, it's, it's related to the sunflower, but it's much smaller. This is... Uh, da, 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 There's the, Joe Pie Weed in there. Ah, uh, yes. This is two varieties of Joe Pie Weed. Don't mind the name. It's not a weed. This one's a very tall one. There's also a shorter one. They bloom at different times, so I grow the shorter one in front of the tall one, so I get both of them. And way... It's New York Iron. That's New York ironweed, and I think that's some more uh, helianthus up there. Another member of the sunflower family, but a short one. They go in front. This one, I can't remember the name. Uh, I'm having one of those. Perennial this is the only No, one. this is not the perennial azurata. Really, it's not. It's purple. <laughs> and it's very feathery and light, and it's already looking like that, and will look like that, and then it'll bloom at the end of the season. It's one of the last things to bloom. We also use rain barrels at our house to catch water. And I really recommend, you know, if you've got gutters, take advantage of it. We have them come down, we can fill the rain barrel, when the rain barrel is full, we, it goes back up and the water goes down as if there was no rain barrel there. We do probably 95% of all of our water now in the rain barrels. It's much better for the plants, it doesn't have chlorine in it, it doesn't have fluorine in it, it doesn't have anything in it, it's just rain water. We also, uh, are watering with water that's approximately the same temperature as the plants because it sits up there, it warms up. They don't look terrible. This is my back patio. This picture was taken when the furniture is on it, but you can see it comes down. This one is more interesting. This one comes down and runs into a pipe about that big around that goes out to the edge of the wetlands. Before the rest of the structure was built, there were trenches dug and it went down about a foot and a half and the water runs out to the wetlands. So instead of causing water problems here, it dumps into the wetlands out of the edge of our property. Oh, okay, <laughs> I forgot about that one. Okay, so that's what that does, and the fieldstone patio allows the water to soak in. Our front walkway is bluestone, once again, to allow the water to soak in so we don't have a water runoff pro problem. And it's just a matter of choice. You know, those choices we made. Obviously, because we were building from scratch, we could do anything we wanted. 
And the other funny thing is that the town actually limits what you can put in to some degree because of the water shortages. And with this, <laughs> they were like, yeah, this is okay. You can do it. Just keep doing what you're doing. There's, there's so much you can do that aren't difficult, that makes your life actually easier and will make save water, save on your water bill, and make your gardens beautiful. Do you have any questions? Yes. So what is your take on um, the irrigation? If I had a place that I couldn't easily water, or if I had a hillside or such, I would put in drip irrigation. I wish I could put in drip irrigation in my vegetable garden, but it's not on my property because my property is too shady. It's on town land, and I can't put in anything permanent there. Mm -hmm. Drip irrigation is very effective. Uh, I, I mean, if you're going to water, it's an ongoing battle with the town because they say you know hand watering only, and at particular hours, and hand watering is a waste. Yes. You know, so Would they even know if you put in drip irrigation? No, I'm going to do it. Oh, <laughs> I just wanted to know about what you thought about it. When, when my town had the total water ban on, we had just moved into a house. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, uh, I can't not water. I just spent thousands of dollars on trees and shrubs. Right. And they said, fine, we understand your unique case. You may water between 5 and 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> So for an entire summer, we got up every morning at quarter of five and went out and watered. They didn't want too many people to see us water. Second question, on the mulching, uh, I, I can't do the leaves this year. We'll do it next year. But uh, I, so I ordered mulch that is pine needles. So oh, mulch. that's great. Pine needles are like leaves. It doesn't remove the nitrogen, I don't believe. No, 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 no. No, it's the bark. It's the woody part yeah, of the tree that removes the nitrogen from right. the soil. No, pine needles, uh, you know, I'm surrounded by pine trees, and luckily a few deciduous trees. And that is what we use on everything. And the, the, it's, I use it on my vegetable garden in my last house where I had the vegetable garden right there, because it's great. It improves the soil while it's saving the water and protecting the plants. Okay. So it's really, it, it's so many wins in so many ways. Okay. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much. You've been very kind. <laughs> <laughs> You've been very informative. Well, thank you. You know, the one the, the interesting thing is I water at night because I was thinking, well, it gives uh, you know, the ground time to have the water in it before the sun starts. Mm -hmm. I water in the morning. It's, it's like it looks like it's just all evaporated off in a matter of 15 minutes. Um, so I'll try to start doing it in the morning, as you suggest. I, Worry about that though. Um, if you've got some mulch down, mm, I do. Everything is mulch. Then most of the water is going through that mulch, yeah. and you're really only drying out the very top part. At our community garden, where we have town water, so we have all kinds of town restrictions on the use mm -hmm. of the water. What we tell people is water. Take a trowel, stick it in. If the water's down two or three inches. That's right. You've got it well watered. It'll last for days. You don't have to come back and water tomorrow. Never just water enough to get a half inch wet because that'll yeah. burn off and you're not doing any good. You're wasting that water. So how, do you, how truly do you get it deeper other than you're using the, the wells? And, well, you if know. you're watering lawns, that's hard, but when you're watering no. plants, you can, you can, I mean, when you water, my beds are all low. They've got an edge on them of some kind or I mulch an edge uh -huh. or whatever, but they're, they're, they're designed so the water goes down into the roots of the plants there. Right. And remember, the plants will go for the water. They will find, I mean, they, the plants are so much smarter than we know. They will go out and then if an area keeps getting wet, they will grow roots there. You know, have you ever seen all the weeds that grow around downspouts? Mm -hmm. I think I'm watering too much. I'm watering almost every day. You probably are. You need to water more and less often. More so of time. Really stick your finger down two inches and if it's still wet. Uh, if it's if it's in the ground, yeah, you want to go down at least two inches, three inches, and then don't come back. Even my vegetable garden only gets watered like twice a week. Okay. Only when they're in the very tiny seedling stage when right. they have virtually no roots do I water more often. Other than that, here it is guys, suck it up and hold on to it. And they do. Plants are not expecting somebody to water them every day. They evolve <laughs> with rain. Yeah.
Can I get something to it? Yeah. That, long, that long perennial border that you saw along the driveway um, has the look <coughs> behind it. First of all, there, there are you know, paper blocks in front, but essentially the, there is a, also a lip of soil behind it mm -hmm. so that as you water it, the water, nothing runs out of it. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. yeah it's, it's not a big dip. There's a, <coughs> the driveway and the paper blocks, and then a slight dip, and then it comes up so that any water that lands in there soaks down in there. Almost everything I have is put in this year because I have a brand new property that didn't know. Okay, so I am watering constantly mm -hmm. because trying to get things established, but I really have put saucers around. I mean, I Right, and, and like you said, with a long bed, we just put a lip on the back of the thing. Okay. There's a lip on it, and people said, that looked weird when we put it in. We said, it's not weird, it's mm -hmm. effective. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, thank you. And if you have a dry area, like on top of a hill or something, Look for things that naturally grow in dry areas. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have to have to that. Yeah. rhododendrons grow up in the mountains. Um, um, da, 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 mm -hmm. yeah. Where am I talking? Appalachians. They yeah. grow up on the mountains. They'll grow. You'll see them coming practically out of rock. Mm -hmm. Once they're established, they need very little water. Mm -hmm. You know, there are lots of things that we can plant that once they get going, they can grow in a lot of water. And forgive me, but we've been misled by nurseries that are trying to sell you things, people who are trying to sell you irrigation equipment, people who are trying to sell you plants that simply shouldn't be put in the places they tell you to put them. And this source for your um, your water donut or whatever you call it? Oh, you should be able to find that at any. You can definitely find them online, but you can find them at, at any good nursery. You should have them. And if you can't, go online. Yeah. Well, online is made life so easy. You know, and gardener supplies, whatever. Right. But, but just, just, um, okay, I'll, I'll see. just Google them. You'll find it. Yeah. Okay. All right. You're welcome. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate the hand up, by the way. You know, it's, it's, uh, after many, many years of going to other people's lectures, I realized I was always missing a third to half of what they said because I was writing down the last thing they said. If I give you something, you don't have to constantly write. Right.